Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and welcome to this special ICG online event, Rebels for Whose Cause? Stories from the Frontline of Gendered Counterterrorism, marking the publication of the report, A Course Correction for Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, Crisis Group's new briefing that was launched last week, and I'm sure all of you have read carefully before uh, attending this event. Um, my name is Naz Modirzadeh. I am a member of the Board of Trustees of the Crisis Group, and I'm going to have the pleasure and the privilege of moderating this event today. I'm going to give a brief introduction to the Crisis Group itself, uh, and then I'll say a few words about the topic of our discussion. I'll introduce our eminent panelists, uh, and then I'll say a word about the format before we get started. Uh, I wanted to note, uh, I did, I recently received an invitation from a colleague of mine, I'm sure many of my co-panelists have had these types of invitations as well, uh, informing me that he wanted me to join an event because he uh, did not want to have an all-male panel, and so that was the reason he wanted me to join, and I did feel like sending an invitation to a token male participant for today's panel, lest we make them feel left out, but uh, here we are. Um, so uh, let me get started. Uh, the crisis group, the International Crisis Group, Group is an independent organization working to prevent wars and shape policies that will build a more peaceful world. Crisis Group aspires to be the preeminent organization providing independent analysis and advice on how to prevent, resolve, or better manage deadly conflict. Today's discussion is going to focus on the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, and you may hear us referring to it as the WPS, and its interaction with efforts to counter violent extremism, and at least for my part, I would otherwise be doing air quotes around violent extremism every time I say it, but because that is obnoxious, please assume that's what I'm doing, uh, and terrorism at the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. We will examine how many women activists feel their activities have become tangled up in and sometimes subordinated to states' efforts to combat Islamic militancy with case studies including Nigeria, Somalia, Tunisia, and Afghanistan. We will discuss practical recommendations that set out a clearer path for future success for governments and donors promoting the WPS agenda. Let me now introduce our speakers. Uh, and again, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you as with so many events these days, I'm sorry we can't all be in the same place, but happy we can be together um, nonetheless. Uh, first, I'll introduce Azadeh Moavini. She is Crisis Group's Gender and Conflict Project Director. Her most recent book is Guest House for Young Widows, which tracks the lives of 13 women who joined the Islamic State and uh, has my personal recommendation as well. Uh, I'll next introduce uh, Hodan Hassan, who is the executive Executive Director of Kulan Consulting. She previously spent 12 years with USAID managing development programs in Sudan and Somalia. Next, introduce Alexandra Deer, who is the Gender Coordinator at the UN Counterterrorism Executive, excuse me, Committee Executive Directorate, also known as CTED. Previously, she served in UN missions in Afghanistan and Burundi. We also have with us Chitra Nagarajan, who is a writer and activist who works to build peace and promote and protect human rights, including those of women in Nigeria. We next have Susan Tahmasabi, who is a women's rights activist and advocate from Iran and founder and executive director of Femina. She has worked at the national, regional, and international levels to promote women's rights, peace, and security for 20 years. And let me say a word about our format. I will uh, first ask Azadeh to just give us a very brief uh, scene setting for about five minutes. I will then ask a series of questions to our speakers and provide them with a brief uh, period of time to answer and engage with those questions. I will then uh, open up to question and answer for 30 minutes uh, at the end. So please, if you've been having questions in your mind, think about those and how you want to present them. And you can just click on the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom box, which will allow you to do that. I'll say a few words more about the logistics of how to do the Q&A when we get to that stage. I do want everyone to please be aware that we are recording this event and it will be shared on the crisis group website as soon as the event is completed. With that, let me turn to Azadeh and could you just do set for us the stage of this report? What are the key findings and, and what's the main approach and purpose of the report? 
Thank you so much, Naz. Uh, and thank you everyone who's joined and all of our uh, guests on this panel and colleagues. Um, it's really an honor to be uh, to be here with all of you. Um, I'm great admirers of, of all of your work and, and such an honor to be moderated by Naz. Um, so I will very quickly, because I'd like to ensure we have as much time as possible to hear um, from the panel, uh, just quickly set out uh, how we arrived at this report and how it derives from the approach that crisis group has taken to its gender and conflict work. Um, we wanted to be part of the debate around the 20th, uh, the 20th anniversary of UN Resolution 1325 in October. It's two decades after the Women, Peace and Security agenda was first ratified. Uh, and we wanted to be part of that stock taking conversation. Uh, so much has changed. Many of the debates around uh, the anniversary were around challenges uh, around uh, implementation, uh, much recognition that the agenda is sprawling, that we're in a very different world than the one in which the agenda was conceived for. We've had the war on terror uh, in the interim um, and a very changing landscape of threats. Uh, we have different forms of conflict and we have um, alongside the growth uh, or the emergence of the war on terror, the rise of counterterrorism policies and cousin policies, the countering violent extremism policies that, um, that we will all uh, have implicit air quotes around, uh, which have themselves so dramatically impacted women and men uh, very much alongside state war uh, itself. Uh, so we're in a very different place um, than we were 20 years ago. So at ICG, we thought, how can we look at uh, the, the evolution of WPS? Um, and we looked back, I looked back and thought, you know, so much of our recent work has been around how women are impacted and experience post-conflict recovery, whether their motivations with armed groups are recognized and understood, and really how they interact with many of these uh, counterterrorism and security policies. We've done recent work on the displacement crisis in Iraq, uh, families, mostly women-led families, who are impacted by state counterterrorism policies uh, that are mostly security focused, uh, women who are living with their children on the fringes of Iraqi society because of their considered ISIS affiliation. Their children can't go to school they cannot get jobs, they cannot get security clearances. Uh, we have our historic work on the ISIS detention camps in northeast Syria and the abandonment of, of hundreds, uh, thousands of Western and, and international women and children uh, to, to essentially be left to die in the desert, no prosecution for them, um, an exceptional treatment as though they're the product of a war that uh, is unlike anything we've experienced before. So uh, very much um, looking at, at states that are in, in many ways trailblazers in women, peace and security themselves finding uh, they face massive dilemmas in, in implementing gender sensitive uh, demobilization and reintegration strategies for their own citizens, let alone you know, all of the women who um, face these issues across the global south in, in long standing conflict settings. So we thought, you know, let us examine how women, peace and security, these, uh, this agenda that has really galvanized and, and sort of propelled a lot of the existing movement and feminist work that was happening uh, around the world. How has it been interacting with CBE uh, and CT? Of course, there is a further resolution that cemented the interaction between these two agendas. Uh, in the wake of ISIS marching across the region and hundreds of women joining ISIS, I think it was recognized, especially by states that were very worried about the spread of Islamist extremism, that jihadist groups in particular had very savvy gender strategies, that they were recruiting women, that they had often better gender strategies uh, or than, than states themselves, uh, and that states had to compete. Um, this is something that I personally uh, felt very close to because when I began my research on why women were joining ISIS in 2015, uh, I was working in a lot of places where countries, governments, Western donors were rolling out these CBE policies, uh, very much focused on ideology uh, as, a, as a mobilization um, and very much focused on women as uh, mothers, detectors of extremism uh, in men. Uh, so I sort of saw these policies being airlifted into context um, and, and saw the sort of misalignment. Uh, and so that's something that sort of personally I wanted to to research and and with uh, with all of my colleagues at ICG we looked at these dynamics across 
uh, a number of different settings. So Somalia, Kenya, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Tunisia, and Kyrgyzstan. So the what we were presenting uh, in this paper is a result of dozens of interviews uh, with women activists, peace builders, however they identify themselves across all these settings. And very quickly, we found that CVE, as is often practiced, and we acknowledge that there is a range of practices of CVE, states very often practice CVE differently than donors, but there are interactions between those approaches, um, often ends up redirecting or distorting the work of women's groups. That women, many women told us that their local priorities, uh, often they're obliged to set them aside and reorient their work around what are outside security policies. So if there's gang violence rife in their community or FGM or domestic violence, uh, or a lack of access to criminal justice, they were encouraged or in order to gain funding, obliged to work on the preventing violent extremism sort of agenda as practiced by many donors. By aligning women in many contexts with states that themselves are very often uh, abusive, security forces that are abusive, often this would put women in harm's way. It would make them the target of violence and stigmatize their work. Third, we found that many of these sorts of policies, hybrid CVE and WPS policies, were simply not very effective. They were short-term focused and did not end up uh, preventing women's uh, or men's mobilization to violence, nor did they genuinely empower women. Uh, and lastly, uh, we found that many of these sort of hybrid programs were rife with gender stereotyping, that they were built around and designed around uh, ideas of women as victims or peace builders or potential monitors of extremism uh, amongst their male relatives, uh, and that they stereotype men as responsible uh, and, and uh, perpetrators of violence, uh, leading to very often security harms against men and boys, and a big gap in reintegration and support policies for women when they are coming out of armed groups. So these are our four major findings. Um, I think we'll have some time in our discussion to talk about what we've uh, suggested as ways of, of improving uh, and doing better different kinds of CVE, a CVE that is more focused on human security and that's rights compliant. Um, and I will look forward to hearing um, to hearing our, our panelists talk about what they think could be done differently as well. Very quickly, we highlight more flexibility uh, in funding, much less stereotyping in terms of uh, post-conflict recovery strategies and demobilization for women, uh, more solid evidence base around what works and what doesn't, and a much more transparent and open uh, assessment of what states are actually doing in their counterterrorism policies uh, and the inclusion of civil society in those kinds of policy discussions. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much, Azadeh. I think a rich basis for us to build on in terms of questions and also hopefully engaging some of the, the critiques of these various positions that I know we've all heard in various contexts. Um, so let me start with a first question, and I'm, I'm going to go first to Hodan uh, once I pose this, and then to Alexandra to give us some context. Uh, the WPS and CVE, again, that's the countering violent extremism agendas, both have critical objectives, and yet integrating them into the same context is a challenge, especially for women activists. In your experience, where have you observed the CVE agenda as practice was turning into a harmful full pursuit, was putting women's safety at risk, or as the report uh, highlights, was diverting them from local priorities. And in answering, it would be wonderful if you could give some specific examples so we could better understand this uh, issue in context. Hodan, could I go to you first? Thank you very much, uh, Naz, and thank you, Crisis Group, for uh, inviting me to this on this panel with these very esteemed ladies. Uh, I think first, just give a little background in terms of my experience. I've been working on development in Sudan and in Kenya, but most of my time has been in Somalia. And of course, Somalia has been um, a centerpiece for a lot of the CTE and CVE interventions by a lot of Western donors because of the presence of Al-Shabaab. And Al-Shabaab has been and continues to be probably the violent extremism not only to, to the wider region. Uh, I don't think through these focuses, primarily CVE programming 
Somali-led women um, to, be, to be explained. One is, is trying to understand in a Somali-specific context, you know, when we mean violent extremism and the emergence of violent, violent Okay, I'm going to step in because I think we are losing Hodan um, due to a connection problem. Hodan, I think you're back. Uh, let me ask you if you could, I'm so sorry, I think we lost you briefly there. Could I ask you to just briefly summarize your initial comments and continue? Uh, apologies. I'm afraid uh, we are not hearing you. Let me um, see if we can get this fixed and then we okay, will. Oh, there you are. Yes, perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, that's perfect. Apologies to everybody. I'll make it quick so I don't take. Um, so just to, to, to go to Somalia specific examples, I think it's important to understand the context in which violent extremism emerged in Somalia. Um, remember that Somalia really has been a failed state. Uh, and in that context, for two decades, without sort of rule of law, without governance, um, you had the emergence um, of a group like Al-Shabaab in that space. Um, and in particular, uh, a lot of folks uh, point back to the um, invasion of Somalia by Ethiopia um, and sort of the ability to take advantage of a nationalistic narrative. And I think that's important because um, when you think about CVE and countering violent extremism, you also need to focus on to what degree is ideology been a factor in the growth of Al-Shabaab in Somalia. And in Somalia, from a, the research that I've done um, across South and Central Somalia and, and other areas, what it seems to emerge is that there are primarily macro level uh, structural issues that have contributed to violent extremism in, in Somalia. So that when you start to think about the types of programming that CVE has been focused on, at least how it's been practiced in Somalia, you're really looking at a number of uh, programs that have been explicitly CVE. Right? There's a lot of programs that tie themselves to CVE goals, but the explicit CVE programs have been primarily um, one around countering, counter, counter messaging against Al-Shabaab narrative, um, to uh, work with youth groups to try to uh, dissuade them from entering Al-Shabaab, um, and then three, some work around helping with reintegration. Um, and the challenge, um, when I've talked to women's groups in Somalia around how they view CVE and CVB, CVE programming, many groups have been, to be very honest, loath to try to accept funding to do explicit CVE programming. And that's because in the Somalia context, there's really no distinction between CVE and CT. And so if you can imagine, you know, in the global war on terrorism and Somalia has experienced and impacted, you know, whether it's the cutting of, you know, of funding to the Hawalas, which have been the lifeline for a lot of Somalis, or um, it's been as Somalis in Somali have seen Somali communities in the uh, U.S. and other areas. So there's really a distrust around the wider CT agenda. So as a result, oftentimes women are, women's groups are not interested because these are often grassroots based organizations that need to be able to move around. Um, and that means that they're going to be moving in areas that may or may not have Shabab control. So they need to, as much as possible, be seen as neutral actors. Um, second, they, because they're small groups, they don't have security. They don't have the capacity to protect themselves should there be threats. So they need to do whatever it takes to try to eliminate those, those threats. Um, and lastly, because Al-Shabaab is such a, an amorphous group and there, there is a, a difficulty to know you know, who they are and where they are. So women tend to also be very wary about invo being involved in any explicit um, CT um, uh, or CVE activities. Um, so as a result, you really um, don't see a lot of women um, actively uh, either getting funding from organizations or being aligned to organizations that are doing CVE work. Thank Great, you. thank you so much. I think it's really helpful for giving us a sort of a contextualized perspective on why women activists might be very wary about this. Alexander, could I turn to you now to give us a sense of kind of the broader uh, dynamics here? Yes, thank you so much, Nels. Um, and uh, let me start by saying what a what a great pleasure it is to be here today with uh, such a wonderful um, group of, of co-panelists and to have the opportunity to discuss this this new and very important report by by Crisis Group. Um, and what really strikes me about about the report and and uh, the examples that we've just hear, heard from from Hodan and, and from Azadeh is that uh, these are really very powerful examples of the harmful uh, effects of CVE on women and on women's rights 
that we are seeing in such a wide range of different local contexts and, and regions. And so I think it's important to stress that we are not just talking about an isolated instance here. Uh, we are seeing these problems across the board and uh, we have been hearing these concerns many times before. Um, civil society has been raising these issues uh, around the instrumentalization, securitization around for gender stereotyping. Uh, and we have a growing body of research to back up uh, some of those claims as well. And so to my mind, uh, one of the key questions going forward is um, to ask what more can we do to ensure that um, this dialogue and engagement with civil society is not just this box ticking exercise where they get to voice these concerns, but then there is no follow up action. Uh, what more can be done to, to really make sure that these concerns concerns are then taken up by decision makers and, and taken into consideration in, in their decisions about new policies and, and programs. So in other words, how, how can we strengthen accountability in this area? I think that that is really one of the key challenges uh, ahead. Um, but I want to also add an, another point here, uh, perhaps a little bit for, for context, and, and maybe that's also a, a little bit of a, of a hopeful note, uh, which is to say uh, and, and to remind ourselves really that this agenda, the integration of, of gender perspectives and of WPS into, uh, into CVE is still a relatively new development. Uh, we are looking at 20 years of the WPS agenda. It's the big anniversary year. And, and as they outlined for us, some of the evolution of, of that agenda, but when it comes to the integration of those perspectives into CVE, that is a much more recent development. And so I do think that that is an agenda that is still very much um, going to evolve and where there are still opportunities to shape it uh, in hopefully meaningful ways. Um, but one of the challenges in this is to continue to develop expertise in this area. And I do think that there are some, some shortcomings still in that regard. I think we've made a lot of progress in terms of raising awareness around the importance of gender and how it is so central to the phenomenon of violent extremism itself. But when it comes to this next step of uh, acting then on the necessity to translate that understanding into concrete and gender sensitive policies, we are still experiencing a, 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 lot, of, a lot of challenges. Um, and, uh, and there is still a lot of need to further develop and refine our understanding uh, of how to do that well. So uh, I do think that at least some of the shortcomings that we, are, that we are seeing, perhaps not all, but some are also due to the fact that we still need to further develop and refine our, our expertise uh, in this area. Thank you so much. And I, I think a useful reminder that unlike many of the intractable seeming conflicts we often discuss here because of the very dynamics Alexandra highlighted, there is a real opportunity, I think, for critique and engagement to influence how uh, these two agendas are brought together and for the issues in this briefing to be moved into practice. Uh, with that, let me move to a second question. Um, do, do you think that the WPS agenda and the CVE agenda share compatible aims at all? Something that we hear very often in the, in the promotional materials, if you will, for, for some of these um, activities. What is the role of civil society um, in this question? And let me go first to Susan to answer this question. Let me just ask you to unmute yourself, Susan. Sorry. Thank you very much for inviting me and including me in this um, incredible panel and um, giving me an opportunity to speak about this issue, which is um, a critical issue that's facing the region that I work in and have been working in for many years, which is the MENA region. I, I want to sort of stress that, you know, in terms of civil society, it's critical for us to remember and not to erase the involvement and the activism of the feminist movements who started decades ago addressing the ex issue of extremism and with the rise of political Islam, especially in the MENA region. And unfortunately, and part of the reason why they addressed this issue is because um, extremism and gender status or women's status are, are, are very much linked. And um, unfortunately, with the sort of the entry of the security sector and the WPS sector, these feminist groups have been sidelined greatly because of some of the issues that also Hodan talked about is because the counterterrorism and the, 
preventing violent extremism approach has largely been focused on, on Islam and counter narratives to Islam. So it sees this extremism um, agenda, sees at the international level, for the most part, really sees extremism as a Muslim issue, as an Islamic issue, and this is problematic because it overemphasizes narratives, counter narratives to Islam, and it so funds a lot of groups that are working on this issue, not the traditional groups that had been working on this issue for many decades, and offer other solutions, more progressive solutions. So basically, the international community community is working along these lines with some of the most regressive groups. I mean, I don't want to say some of them are progressive and they're offering counter narratives to Islam, and you know that are rooted in rights, but many of them are actually offering more aggressive messaging on women and on rights, but they're promoting peace. So their counter narrative focuses on peace, but not so much on rights. And so uh, we see a reductionist approach in terms of the agendas that are being taken up in these, in these contexts. And I want to remind people that 10 years ago, we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the revolutions in the Arab world, which articulated very progressive messages on rights, on democracy, on inclusion, on civic participation. And 10 years later, we've, we've stepped back and we're, we're the, our, our, our interaction with, with these, in these contexts are, are, tend to be rather regressive and, you know, or very selective on, on, on uh, rights within Islam and rights within religion. At the same time, I think it's important to look and also see that what's happened 10 years down the line after these Arab revolutions that, you know, within the framework of, um, uh, of um, counterterrorism, that a lot of these governments are also using this label to crack down on civil society. And really, civil society can and should be seen as an antidote to um, the growth of extremism and um, providing uh, peaceful opportunities for citizens to express their frustration as opposed to joining um, uh, extremist groups. And when they don't have those opportunities, then, they're, then they are attracted to these extremist groups. So I think that in that sense, the counterterrorism and the CV agendas advocated by states have done us wrong and have steered us wrong. Um, so when we see that, you know, when, when states are not addressing underlying causes, where states are using terrorism um, as, a, as a strategy to crack down on civil society, and international community is not necessarily addressing some of those underlying causes, then we see an overburden on civil society and this is problematic. And I think for the most part, much of, you know, if, and I'll talk about this later, I'm sure, but um, when the international community is not really addressing some of those underlying causes, which is, you know, development issues, corruption, uh, repression, um, uh, injustices, um, then civil society is left alone to burden uh, and to, sh to shoulder the, the greater burden of addressing um, uh, violent extremism. And um, yeah, so I think that, you know, and this also affects very negatively women's groups because women and civil society efforts are, have become the showcase for the international community to basically say, um, to basically say that we are doing something about CVE, but they're not really doing something about CVE in terms of real policy changes that it will have effect. Thank you very much, Susanna. I think an important framing in terms of some of the burden shifting that happens to civil society. Chitra, could I bring you in on this topic? Yes, of course. And I just want to add to something Susan said um, about what women have been doing. And women and feminist activists, women's rights activists, have been doing anti-violence work, um, countering violence and the drivers of violence, countering um, narratives around religious fundamentalist narratives that underpin the violence that we see, expanding access to education um, for decades, um, way before both the international women, peace and security and CBE agendas. Um, and also, um, I'd like to remind us that CVE, when people came up with the idea of it, was supposed to be a move away from the hard counter-terrorist approaches that produced human rights violations. So on the face of it, you would think that they would be complementary. Um, however, in practice, that has proved not to be the case. And, and I, I'll talk here specifically about the example of Nigeria, which is the context I know best. 
Um, and I will be really blunt and say that in my view, CVE CT policy as practiced by states does not care about women and women's rights. So I think there's a real difference between the WPS agenda, which for me should be about women's rights, peace and security, and the CVE agenda, which has turned out to be just about the security of states. So when we talk about violence, extremism, security, whose uh, security are we talking about? Um, who, uh, violence against whom are we talking about? And in reality, what we see in Nigeria is CVE perpetrating very severe human rights violations that are gendered in nature. So here I'm talking about the arbitrary detention and extrajudicial killing of primarily men and boys. Um, also the gender-based violence committed against women and girls. And the WPS agenda and the interaction of WPS and CVE has not done anything to raise that. Um, in further, and carrying on from what Susan said about civil society, in Nigeria, we've seen anti-terrorist financing laws um, really constrain civil society space, both in terms of delivery of humanitarian assistance in the Northeast, but also when it comes to protests against straight, uh, state brutality and violence. And the most recent example here is in the aftermath of the NSARS protests, the way the government used anti-terror financing legislation um, to really stop uh, and freeze the bank accounts of activists, feminist activists, the feminist coalition that was raising money uh, to fund and mobilize the protests to provide healthcare uh, for protesters who were injured by, by police violence, to provide food, to provide shelter. And, and in, that, in such a context, I'm not sure that you can say that Women, Peace and Security and CVE are complementary agendas. Because for me, a WPS agenda that doesn't center women's rights and human rights is a WPS agenda that is meaningless. Great, uh, provocative and clear. Thank you, Chitra. Alexander, let me come to you last on this uh, on this question and your view of, of the, the, the two agendas and whether they do share the same aims. Yeah. Um, so let me let me make uh, perhaps three three points on on that in terms of how how I see um, the the integration of of the two. One thing uh, that I think is is crucial is that we don't limit the conversation just to the participation component, uh, and that is something that is being uh, very often highlighted. Uh, but I think uh, that integrating gender and WP perspectives across uh, CVE policies and programs. Uh, is about ensuring that women's rights are protected beyond the question of participation. And I think it is also important that it's not just incumbent on women's organizations to make sure that these policies are gender sensitive. That is the responsibility of everybody who's involved in uh, decision making and implementation of these policies and, and programs. So, so all of the policymakers, all of the donors have a responsibility here to make sure that these programs are fully human rights compliant, including with a view towards specifically women's uh, women's rights. Um, so we can't just defer that to, to those women to take care of that themselves. Um, second of all, um, I do think that it is important when we're talking about gender sensitive CVE to highlight that gender does not just equal women. Uh, and so that gender sensitive CVE must include an awareness of gender that, that uh, captures this um, gender as a relational concept that is addressing the uh, underlying um, gendered power structures and gendered inequalities and that gender stereotyping is something uh, that harms both men and women and as Ade referred to this in, in her opening remarks uh, I think we see many initiatives where um, uh, men and boys are being stereotyped or seen predominantly as this at risk demographic uh, that uh, sort of at risk of, of potential radicalization and recruitment and of, of becoming violent perpetrators, whereas uh, especially young women and girls are very often kind of cast into this category of, of passive victims. And this is harmful to, to everybody. And it, it also fails to, 
tap into the, the positive and transformative potential of these individuals within their communities and within, within their societies. Um, so I think this needs to be addressed as well. And then the, the third and, and final point that I want to make on this is that uh, while we're focusing our discussion here on, on CBE, I do think that it is also important to talk about the wider CT spectrum. Uh, and Chitra already mentioned a couple of very powerful examples um, of the sort of harder end of uh, the counterterrorism spectrum uh, from law enforcement, border security issues, the criminal justice system, uh, the issue of uh, countering terrorism financing laws and how those very directly affect women and women's rights uh, and have gendered impacts. I think that that is something very important um, to stress that we also must be working towards ensuring that the full spectrum of counterterrorism measures is implemented in, in a human rights compliant and, and gender sensitive way. And that we don't just sort of marginalize and, and silo the discussion around um, around women's rights, around gender, and around civil society participation to the sort of so-called softer side that, that is uh, CVE. It's, it's relevant and, and essential across the board of, of the full counterterrorism spectrum. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, very useful. And I think it, it's something that we can bring into our consideration of the next question I have, and this one I'm going to pose to all of the panelists. Um, Given what we've discussed until now, both in terms of the context for civil society, some of the particular geographically focused examples that we've discussed, and the question of how these various agendas interact with one another, or are in dialogue with one another, or, or are indeed in tension with one another, um, whose door should we be knocking on in order to improve these policies? Um, states who practice CVE internally or otherwise, donors who practice and fund CVE, uh, WPS community and advocates that are participating in WS programming, what can more progressive and change-focused donors do to influence and better shape the WPS approaches of other actors and other donors in this regard? So essentially, how do we move forward with this, utilizing some of the very um, important reflections and analysis we have both in the briefing and in all of your comments? Hodan, let me go to you first on this question. Uh, okay. Um, I think definitely you need to go to those who have the capacity to actually move change forward. Um, and if we're talking about in the space of WPS and CVE, you're going to be talking about, about the UN as a multilateral institution that can able to sort of shape and guide you know, policies, um, but also the key Western donors in particular who are the primary drivers of CVE programming, funders of CVE and WPS programming. Um, so I think those are the key actors. Now, what message should we be saying to them, I think is another important question. And maybe I'm gonna go out on a limb and, and say that uh, emphasize the WPS agenda and de-emphasize the CVE agenda. Because I've, at least on the Somalia um, experience is that been, is the has been that when you actually talk to women and you tell that and ask them, what are the critical areas that need focus what are your problems? What are the challenges that you face? It is not um, necessarily uh, an issue directly related to violent extremism. It is primarily um, issues related to their own safety and security to be moving around places without being, um, uh, you know, potential victims of sexual um, assaults. The ability to earn a basic living. The ability to um, to be able to ensure that should there that there is a justice system that is able to cater to their specific needs. Um, to be able to see their kids go to school. Um, so those are the sort of issues, sort of meat and potato issues that a lot of the women face. And so my question to, to donors is going to be, um, one, how do you actually center the very women um, who are often the victims of multiple sources of, of violence um, at the heart of determining what their problems are and determining what the solutions are? Um, and so I think you'd find a very different set of interventions that would be developed um, and probably more effective, if you ask me. Thank you. Thank you, really useful. Uh, Alexandra, let me go to you next. Yeah, so I think um, I would have two, two key messages for, uh, for donor states on, on this issue. The first one is to, um, to highlight that everyone 
has a lot more work to do to make sure that that gender and WPS considerations are are properly are properly integrated into their counterterrorism and CVE practices. Um, I think it's um, so essential that uh, we don't sort of create the impression that this is just um, a, a demand and an agenda that is being imposed on on one group uh, of of states and actors over over others. It's um, a collective undertaking uh, that we have to make sure that counterterrorism and CVE is human rights compliant and that it is uh, gender sensitive and there can be no no double standard on on that and so uh, for for the credibility of of this work it's it's essential uh, that uh, everybody uh, pre um, uh, practices what they what they preach they make sure that if they are promoting this agenda uh, internationally that they make sure that in their own domestic practices uh, they also uh, adhere to it uh, fully um, and the the second uh, the second um, recommendation or or request that I would have would be for donors to really insist on systematic and rigorous uh, impact evaluations of the human rights and gender impact of uh, CVE programs. I think that that is a critical shortcoming that we are facing at the moment, that that kind of uh, impact assessment is not being carried out systematically. Um, and it is uh, essential for us to, to build up a robust evidence base um, so that we can understand where practices are falling short, where we need to uh, improve, where we need to course correct. And without tracking this, monitoring this systematically, uh, we are going to, to have a hard time doing, doing better going forward. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And let me just, uh, before I move to our next two speakers, let me remind our audience, uh, please do use the Q&A function in Zoom in order to uh, ask our questions. You can start posing them now if you like. Uh, you simply need to go to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we would ask that you just uh, include your name and affiliation, include the question that you have there, and then I will be turning to those as soon as we're done with the, um, with the panelists' presentations, and we'll look forward to engaging uh, the audience's questions. Uh, with that, let me go to Chitra. Yes, thank you. Um, let me start by saying that adding women into CT and CVE policymaking in and of by itself um, doesn't really do much for women and women's rights without wider transformation to ensure that these of these policies and practices to make sure that they address and mitigate the human rights violations and the gendered harms, um, as Alexandra said before. Um, I also want to remind us of the need to address the gender inequality that underpins and drives violence. Um, research has shown us that levels of gender inequality are one of the best predictors of whether a country will experience violence. Um, and there's not much enough recognition of this in the policies and programming that we see. And what that means is thinking about how we can help women in their communities and men too, to transform gender norms, how we can build and support space for women's voice and agency, but also expand um, interpretations of religion towards those of increased tolerance. And I want to speak a little bit here about the reality that when we talk about violent extremism, usually we're just talking about one religion. Um, and I, I don't want to say that religion is not an issue. Um, in Northeast Nigeria, where I work, um, I have interviewed young people who joined armed opposition groups um, that people call Boko Haram, and they will tell you that um, particular interpretations of religion that were preached at to them were one of the main reasons that they joined. So it's not that religion is not the issue, it's, it's not the only issue. Um, also, um, religious fundamentalism drives violence, not just in Muslim contexts, but other contexts as well. Um, so I think we need to expand our idea of what constitutes fundamentalism, what constitutes extremism to other religions as well. Um, and I think this goes back to something that I was saying earlier about the nature of security and the nature of the violence that is considered to be serious. And it strikes me that when we look at other forms of religious fundamentalism that lead to violence, often the, the fundamentalists have um, to some extent captured the state. 
as well. So if you look at, for example, Sri Lanka, where we have a government that's really pursuing um, Buddhist hegemonic practices, if we look at India, where the Hindu conservative right and religious fundamentalists have also captured the state. In both those contexts, there is very significant levels of violence towards religious minorities, towards women uh, and patriarchal interpretations of religion, um, to those of non-normative sexual orientations, gender identities and gender expressions. But why as a global community is not, not considered as seriously as we consider forms of Islamic um, fundamentalism that challenges the state. So I would really encourage us to widen out to that. And then my last point, is I'm really interested to know what policy and programs that start with women's rights, peace and security at their core and build out to that, build out from that, rather than starting from some other objective and trying to put in women would look like. And I think that's what we really need to look at. Look at human, human rights, women's rights centered policy making um, rather than kind of adding women into um, practices and policies that have other objectives. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Susan, let me go to you last on this question. Uh, thank you. So I'm not going to repeat all the, you know, all the really excellent points that people made, and especially Chitra, because I think we really have very similar thinking on this. So thank you for for making those points. I think my, one of my main recommendations is really underlying. It's you know, it's about societies and that the the responsibility of the international community and governments is to stop treating. Um, extremism as an, solely an ideological issue. Ide ideology is a big component of it, um, but it's not the only component. And um, uh, we need to look at fascism. So we need to look at other forms of fundamentalisms, as Chitra said. So that's very important. But we also, but it, it's important to look at extremism as a political issue and a political problem, and really start to address the, you know, the discontents that lead to it. And especially in the MENA region, we have many, you know, meta narratives of discontent. Chief among them is the Palestinian crisis. It's the wars, the occupation against Iraq, Afghanistan. You know, the continuing droning and bombing and then also what's happening around the world where Muslims are being um, targeted and um, you know there's growing Islamophobia that feeds into this ideology but then as I mentioned earlier issues about lack of democracy uh, repressive policies of the state crackdown of dissent economic issues the, the incredible um, uh, inequalities not just of women but of, of, of various uh, various groups and then I have, you know, so that I, I think it's important that, you know, especially in the MENA region, that we have balanced policies towards the states that we call, you know, for the US, for example, and EU, call their allies out on these issues. As Chitra said, many of these governments are also extremist governments. And, you know, with the MENA region, we nobody is really count, calling out on Saudi Arabia or Turkey or these other governments that are not only repressive, but are also supporting extremists extremist groups while claiming to also be fighting them, but they're using that, that those um, policies to actually crack down on dissent. And then very specifically, I think in terms of WPS and women's groups, it, it, it's critical that we look at the problems in, you know, in these contexts as interrelated, that we have development problems, rights problems, and we have security problems, and they're very interrelated. It's I, I think it's counterproductive to really silo this out. And I think donors really need to think about this at the international level. There's a, um, I think there's a tendency to create a hierarchy where peace and security is higher and better than rights, then it's rights, then it's, you know, development is on the lower, you know, part of the, the, the spectrum and it's not as important. But actually when you're living in those contexts, they're very interrelated. And I think it's important to, um, give women, if we talk about women's agencies, allow them to address the multiplicity of issues that are lead, that are causes that are leading to extremism and to violence, um, whether it's development or it's rights. They, they know best, so we shouldn't say, oh, you need to only work on counter narratives because this fits my agenda or it's going, it's going to be a nice showcase piece. But if you want to address development issues, because this is a disc, issue of discontent that's leading to extremism, then we're going to support you to do it. I'll stop there.
Excellent. Thank you so much. Let me at, thank all of our panelists and, of course, Azade for your uh, input up until this point. I think we have a lot of fodder for discussion and plenty to uh, plenty amongst the panelists, but also plenty for others to um, to give feedback on or ask further questions on. We already have a number of excellent questions. So let me start with one from Phoebe Donnelly. And um, I, I may add to this because it's a question I had as well. Alexandra, you've asked for and emphasized and also Azade in the briefing, you know, the importance of impact analysis. And, and Phoebe asks, um, many panelists have called for a need for better evidence and expertise around the intersection of CVE, CT, and WPS, yet there is also a hesitancy to engage in further research around these topics, given the harms that this programming can cause and the negative association with these programs in the Global South. As, as Hodan pointed out, many women in the Global South do not want to talk about, quote, CVE. How do we ethically build up expertise and evidence, given some of the challenges in actually documenting the very impact of these programs? Alexandra, let me come to you on this question first. Yeah, thank you for uh, for that question. I, I think there's there's a, a lot that that we can uh, talk about here. Um, I, I will say that you know we have seen. Uh, overall, an exponential growth of research on on these issues, and that research has been really fundamental, I think, in um, in helping us understand better the different nuances um, of the various gender dynamics of violent extremism. Um, and I think that the the key challenge that I see in terms of um, in terms of going forward is um, how to uh, take that uh, that research and those insights and findings and um, develop uh, uh, concrete and actionable policy recommendations on the way forward, um, bring those to the attention of policymakers. Uh, and uh, as, as I was uh, saying earlier, and ensuring that they are then actually being acted upon and that if there are recommendations for how to course correct and how to change existing practices how how do we make sure that there is then accountability for taking that on board if if we do have that evidence base so so i think that that has been um the main challenge that that i have seen it hasn't been the um it hasn't been the lack of uh, of research i think the research itself has has evolved and has uh, itself grown more more nuanced and and more sophisticated and that has been uh, extremely helpful to to policymakers um and i think it's it's clear though that of course that research has to adhere to um to ethical standards and and not impose on uh, local communities and women in particular a particular view of of uh, cve um expose them to risks and engage with with researchers in the same way that we you know do not want to uh, in any sort of way uh, force them to engage in CVE programs themselves. But I think we have to have ways of um, of having these conversations in um, in a safe way for the individuals uh, concerned um, and to to hear their uh, their voices and uh, and their views and in, incorporate that into then the policy discussions that we are having on on these issues. Thank you, Hodan. Let me come to you and ask the question, and in a way, um, just building on what Alexander said, in your view, is it realistic to expect there to be impact analysis on, on the real potential harms being caused here, given some of the risks that you highlighted earlier? Uh, actually, I don't think there are risks um, as long as you know, you're know you targeting them. If the question is, can you find out whether or not the current set of activities under CT or CVE are harming women. I, I don't, provided that it's done in partnership with women's groups who understand the lay of the land, who can provide guidance on, you know, what types of questions to ask, how to ask, they all have their abilities to, to, to maneuver um, and, and be able to, I think, get at the heart of, of, of the question that you're asking. So I don't think it's so difficult um, to, to get at that. Um, I think the wider question around impact of the, now separately the impact of whether or not these CVE interventions are actually successful or actually able to reduce or con counter violent extremism. I think for me personally, that has been my challenge over the last you know 20 years of doing development work. Most of that in this region has been that I have not seen 
um, compelling evidence base to say that these types of activities, especially those that are taking place in Somalia and that are explicitly CVE, have actually done anything to counter violent extremism. And when you talk to people, um, number one, they'll say, really, we don't have a VE problem, we have a V problem. We have a violence problem. If you can get to the heart of what are the sources, uh, what, what's contributing to violence in our society and from a variety of actors, and you start to unpack that, then we feel we have a better chance at, at addressing these issues. Once you input the extremism aspect of it, and as we've all talked about today, you know the, the, the concerns around it being an explicitly Islamic um, focus that gets a lot of uh, people into a very defensive position and ultimately makes it really difficult for women to, to move forward. So for example, just one quick example, Somalia now is getting ready for an electoral process and women are trying to get a 30% quota in parliament so that they can, and, and that's been continuing to be challenged. Um, and so when women are with funding from Western donors are trying to advocate that, then they're accused of trying to bring a Western agenda, right? And so when you start to sort of have that um, uh, sort of con conservatism um, and, and, and suspicion of anything from the West that has implications on women and their ability to move forward. Thank you. Thanks. That's really useful. And I think it reminds us that impact analysis goes both ways. So it's not only a question of what is the impact on civil society, but also the question of is our CVE programs actually effective in ending purported violent extremism, right? So both of those, I think that's a really important issue to highlight. Um, let me pose now a, a second question. We have uh, this one from Mara Revkin from Georgetown Law and a real expert in, in uh, issues related to these areas in her own right. Uh, I'm going to go first to Azadeh with this question and then to Susan. And the question is, several NGOs and UN agencies in Iraq are working closely with tribal authorities on efforts to facilitate safe return and reintegration of families with perceived IS affiliation, including many women whose IS affiliated husbands are dead or missing. But tribal law is very unfavorable to women permitting honor killings and other harmful practices. Do you have any recommendations for organizations that are working with tribes on reintegration or other quote CVE programs to ensure that such programs don't undermine women's rights and human rights? And if I can just add an um, expander to that, in essence, I think this question is also getting at very well with the overall critique, but what about those who are already in the midst of CVE programming? How do they incorporate some of your concerns and critiques? Azadeh? Let me just ask you to unmute yourself, Azadeh. Sorry. Um, thank you for that question. Thank you, Tamara, uh, for, for joining um, and bringing her perspective. Uh, that's such a, a great way to, to come into this from a sort of unfolding, very complicated uh, context. Um, so unfortunately, our second round of uh, field research in Iraq, where we were going to really get granularly into the kind of um, strategies that we thought we could be able to recommend was cut short by COVID. So what I'm going to say is preliminary based on um, our first round, uh, which wasn't as expansive as we wanted it to be. Um, but one one thing that we thought would sort of adjacent, Mara, to what you're asking, but I think would impact it, is to think much more carefully and to have donor organizations or international organizations who are working on this, uh, think about what they could do to incentivize community buy-in to these families return. Because very often those tribal leaders or their tribal sheikhs are channeling the resentment, lingering discontent of the community that they represent. So the community feels that uh, it suffered, their loved ones were killed by ISIS, that they haven't been compensated, that their areas have not been rebuilt. Uh, so one way to sort of mitigate that uh, sentiment that often we found uh, and heard that tribal leaders were, were representing was to deal with the community's grievances and their community's expectations of being heard and listened to on the other side of this process as well. Uh, and that that would um, be a sort of adjacent effort that would impact what um, what sort of the mediation could end up 
the protection that the mediation could eventually offering uh, to women. Uh, secondly, we thought that um, delinking security clearances from the documents that women needed to be able to survive when they went back into their home community. So to be able to rent an apartment or rent a house, to be able to get a job, they need uh, these documentations or national ID cards that they can't have, as, as you know, um, without a security clearance. And so delinking that would give women much greater autonomy in going back um, and, and slightly lessen uh, to an extent their dependence on these, uh, these agreements made between security forces and tribal leaders, sort of men about them. Uh, and then related to that, supporting women materially. It seems like a, a, a simple solution, but women who have some material support have more flexibility about where they're going to go back. So if they feel that a particular home area is hostile to them, that they are not wanted back in that community for a myriad of reasons, they have more options about where to live, where to go. Uh, and alongside that, we found that you know the assistance in supporting their clearance process so that they could get some sort of work and, and some sort of livelihood, uh, again, was uh, provided some measure of protection from the process that you point out on its own um, is, is very hard to improve upon. So these are the things we were thinking around that. I hope that sort of gets somewhat at, at it. It's a very complex thing. Absolutely. Susan, could I come to you? Did you? Do you have further comments on this question of those who may be working particularly with, with tribal uh, groups and others that could have um, laws and regulations that are um, uh, disadvantageous, uh, potentially in the, in the extreme for women? Yeah, so I, I think I talked about that initially when I talked about the CV agenda and civil society and the sidelining of feminist groups and groups that you know, advocate rights. I think that, um, uh, and, and I really speak about this from a, from a uh, perspective of somebody who's worked at the national level and we've seen um, this kind of approach to women's rights um, uh, as well. Uh, I think one strategy, I mean, Azad has very specific recommendations. Mine are a little bit broader. One strategy is to, to sort of expand the pool of partners that you work with, the pool of stakeholders that you work with, that you can't just work with tribal communities. You have to work with other groups and particularly women's groups and feminist groups that uh, really have a long history of advocating for rights. And then as international groups going into these contexts, it's, it's, you know, it's imperative for us to adhere to international human rights standards. We can't undermine those standards and, you know, because we lower the bar for people working at the local level. So people working at the local level, they have to have a variety of tool box, tools with which to work on these issues. So sometimes perhaps they can't advocate for full rights when they're working with um, tribal communities, for example. But if we go in with a lowered bar, then we also limit them. We, you know, that's, people at the local level have to be creative in doing it, but we can't lower the bar for them going in from the international level and say, okay, it's okay to disregard the rights of women, um, you know, because we're working with tribal groups. So I think that we, we have an obligation to live up to those international human rights standards. Um, and we can't lower that. And I'll give you one quick example. So somebody from Afghanistan was saying that with these, you know, when we work with these tribal groups and these tri tribal justice mechanisms, it's as if to say, you know, if you're working on medical issues to sort of say, oh, well, we can't, we don't have the capacity to provide medical care. So let's just do traditional medicine. And this, you know, if the international community came in and said that, people would be, you know, outraged, but we're doing this all the time when it comes to rights and when it comes to women's rights. And it's just, it's just a, that relative approach to rights is, is, is unacceptable. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let me now, I'm going to uh, try to c c combine two questions uh, that get to, I think, a really critical aspect that we haven't touched on so much, and that is national implementation. What do these things look like uh, in national action plans? And also, if we were to think about some of the uh, challenges in, again, quote unquote, extremism in Western countries. So first, um, a question that I'm going to pose to Chitra, which is, uh, how should 
gender best be addressed in the national action plans, sorry, gender and violent extremism best be addressed in national action plans on 1325. Have the national action plans been useful? And what would you want to see coming next, particularly for Nigeria's next national action plan? That's coming from Liz Pearson. And, and then let me add the second question. And this one, I'm going to go to uh, Alexandra and Susan for how should Western states uh, link WPS and C CVE in their domestic policy, so not as donors, but rather within their own states, uh, should they do that at all? And given that radicalization, of course, also happens in Western states, and particularly right-wing extremism, how can WPS be linked to those? And that's coming from Helena Luer at Goethe University in Frankfurt. So let me go first to you, Chitra. Yes, and thank you, uh, Liz, for that um, for that question. Um, I'll start by saying that many, not all, national action plans tend to be uncritical about CVE. Um, they see um, the integration of the WPS and CVE agendas as an opportunity to infiltrate so-called hard security spaces uh, with a WPS agenda. But that tends to be limited to participation um, by which I mean trying to make sure that there are women who are part of CVE programming, which is important, um, but is not enough in and of itself, as I mentioned earlier. And I think we need to be a lot clearer, thinking ahead to Nigeria's third national action plan, currently in development, much clearer in our analysis and who are the perpetrators of harm. And that includes not only armed opposition groups, which is what the current na national action plan assumes, but also state actors and also civilians as well. Um, so think about who perpetrates harm, how do people perpetrate harm? And I would really like to see an app which has an approach to addressing the gendered harms committed by states in the pursuance of their CVE policy, um, in addition to addressing the harms committed by armed opposition groups. Um, we also need to reflect the voices and the perspectives of women who've been doing really excellent work um, monitoring and documenting these human rights violations. And I would kind of flip the question around a little bit as well to say we really need to also rethink um, what gender and women, peace and security means for broader CVE and conflict policy as well. And going back to this idea that really if we want to address one of the root causes of conflict and violence, we need to address levels of gender inequality, think about how we transform gender relations um, as well as look at particular ways that conflict, CVE, DDRR policy stereotypes people of different genders. And I'm talking about DDRR specifically, because in Nigeria at least, but also other countries, we find, broadly speaking, um, over surveillance um, of men and boys, capturing them within the system, um, whereas women and girls maybe do not experience the harms of detention, um, and you know, um, long time without trials, um, but they also don't avail of the um, the support and the skills training and the psychosocial support and all the other interventions that are provided to people who pass through those DDR programs. They're kind of just left to get on with it, um, and so we really need to think about what gender actually looks like when it comes to recruitment, retention and recidivism and make sure that state policies look at the gendered realities rather than gender stereotypes about what the realities are. Really useful and I hope audience members were taking notes there because I think that had a lot of very, very concrete advice for those thinking about national action plans and for those seeking to input their advocacy or activism into those plans. Alexandra, let me come to you now on this big question of Western states donors domestic approaches and also the issue of right wing extremism. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really glad that, that we have a question on uh, non Islamist type violent extremism and, and the extreme right in particular. And um, that is an issue that has been um, on the rise very, very significantly in, in recent years and that um, uh, finally is also gaining more attention uh, internationally, including at the UN and, and in CTED's work. So this is um, a really uh, important, important development. And I can't stress enough 
of how important the gender dimensions of extreme right wing um, uh, terrorism uh, are and how important it is that we that we address those. Um, and they manifest themselves in, in a number of ways, uh, starting from uh, the misogynistic ideology of, of many of these groups and, and how that misogynistic ideology intersects and, and is really essential to then uh, the, the racial dimension, uh, the, the racist dimension of, uh, of, these, um, of these ideologies, uh, the way in which uh, right-wing extremist groups uh, appeal to, uh, to men and to certain notions of, of violent masculinity in, in very skillful ways. Um, and and have that as as an important part of their of their propaganda efforts of their recruitment efforts, um, and uh, we do also see, despite these sort of misogynistic ideologies and tendencies of these groups, a rise in women's participation uh, in in these movements, and so that is also something that is very important uh, to look at. Um, and I think that hopefully, if there is a sort of one lesson that we have learned from the challenges of of dealing with with ISIS and the neglect of, of some of the gender dimensions in that regard, it's to not leave these gender questions uh, sort of to, to the end as, as an afterthought as we think about how we can address this new challenge of, um, of the extreme right, but to really make sure that we incorporate gender very much from the outset in terms of how we frame our response um, uh, to this issue. And I think in light of the many shortcomings that uh, we have been discussing and that exist within uh, the CVE space more widely, there are some very important questions around um, how, how do we approach this phenomenon of the extreme right and how many of the existing tools can we, can we use and to what extent do we need to develop uh, new and, and different approaches. And so uh, I think that uh, we, we do actually engage in an exercise of, of critically thinking about some of those shortcomings and that we we don't just uh, copy and paste. Uh, and, and I would say that um, meaningfully integrating gender uh, considerations into our response is, is one very important improvement uh, that, uh, that we could start with as, as we uh, begin to address this, uh, this urgent new, new challenge. Great, thank you. And Susan, I know you've been thinking about this issue as well. So let me turn to you quickly on this question. Yeah, so I agree um, that we need to really look at um, the gender dimensions of growing right wing politics and fascisms, etc. But I want to point, I want to sort of bring attention to another uh, development that's been happening for a very long time that's very much linked to this discussion. And it's, you know, it's, um, it encompasses uh, extremisms in, 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 in all contexts, really. And it's what's happening at the UN level is that we have systematic pushbacks specifically on women's rights, on women's sexual and reproductive rights, and then on uh, women's, you know, or civil society participation, etc. through many of these right wing and fascist groups that are active, um, both um, in term, both as non-state actors, as NGOs within the UN space, but then also working in concert with governments, with fascist governments, right-wing governments, but then also with the uh, extremist governments from, you know, from the from Islamic countries. So you see this sort of this convergence, and you know, you see this incredible display of of uh, misogynistic belief come to play um, that's actually targeting. Um, uh, international guarantees, starting with language, but international guarantees for rights, not only women's rights, but the rights of minorities. And I think that that's a really important thing um, that we need, you know, people in Western societies who still have some uh, relative space, civil society space to engage in these spaces um, to not only hold their own governments accountable uh, to uphold these international human rights standards, but to also be present in those spaces and facilitate the participation of groups that are being attacked, you know, in those spaces that they can speak up and prevent the undermining of our rights at the international level. So I think that, you know, and it really, I think it really comes, you know, the, the onus falls on all UN member states, but particularly on Western states that say we believe in and we support rights and um, equality. 
Thank you, Susan. I'm going to come to you for a speed round of um, just to, to bring to you a, a critique that I think we've heard on this um, report and similar crit critiques of the relationship between WPS and CVE, which is sort of what about women who want to be doing CVE programming and isn't WPS a security agenda after all? What's so bad about securitization? Let me come to you for, for a very sweet answer on that. Um, so on women who want to be doing CVE or some sort of PVE, um, we, we absolutely um, support and, and think that they should be able to engage with whatever donors um, hopefully are equitably supporting their efforts and safely supporting their efforts. Um, there are absolutely contexts where there are progressive, flexible-minded donors who uh, are responsive to their uh, activists and affiliated organizations uh, in, in in various settings. Uh, there's a really interesting example in the report, and I'll be very quick, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, where there was um, an NGO that was doing CVE work, working with the donor, uh, following the donor's framework on uh, ideology, and it ended up creating a lot of tension with women. Women who wore the headscarf felt very um, uh, discriminated against. It was not facilitating conversation. The NGO pushed back against the donor, the donor adapted, and there were much better outcomes. Uh, so there's possibilities um, of improving the CVE that's done and also in the instances where it is working, um, well then that is, um, you know, we highlight that there are good examples too. We're not only highlighting the monolithic ones where there are problems. Uh, and on whether or not the WPS agenda is a security agenda, um, I think as, as, as Chitra has said, as Susan has said, it emanated out of previous feminist movements and ground-based rights work. Uh, and there's fantastic writing by uh, an activist, a Sudanese activist called Halal Karib, who points out that perhaps what the WS, WPS agenda has done is overly NGOized women's political movements, who previously, in previous iterations, before uh, all of this arrived at the UN and was taken up by Western donors, uh, took place through labor unions or different types of movements and organizing. So she calls for a sort of relocalization of WPS um, and, uh, and a move away from almost a corporatization uh, of, of what has happened. So is it a security agenda? It does sit in the Security Council. I think it is conceived of um, globally and has origins in a movement that is much wider. And security, of course, is when practiced well and not uh, inflicting harms of its own, a good concept. So I think what we're trying to point out uh, in, in this report and what women have, have said is you know security that's genuine security that is not uh, accompanied by or negated by rights violations and abuses uh, and that is viewed uh, as a, a wider sort of human security rather than a narrow end to one type of narrow violence it tends to only target states so um, that's my quick answer to that and i will end Thank you so much. And, and let me note, by the way, and apologies, of course, to all of our participants to whose questions we were not able to uh, get to. Let me note that um, a number of the questions that we weren't able to answer actually touch on that very point that Azad made at the end, that there are issues here about economics, about redistribution, about power and politics that play into not only both of these agendas on their own, but also how they interact. Um, so hopefully we'll have another chance to address some of those questions. Let me thank our panelists so much, Azadeh, Alexandra, Chitra, Susan, and Hodan. Thank you so much for engaging in this fascinating conversation today. Thank you to our participants and attendees for joining us um, and for discussing this uh, briefing, Rebels for Whose Cause, stories from the front line of gendered counterterrorism. Let me also recommend to you upcoming crisis group work on Yemen, Mali, and Afghanistan that will be related to many of the issues we've discussed here today. A recording of this event will be made available on the Crisis Group website, as well as on the Crisis Group's YouTube channel after the event. Thank you so much to everyone, and I wish everyone a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.